in the middle of the last decade, they fuel too much economic growth, they fuel bubbles and fuel excesses and over uh, building and over speculation. So the Fed gets it wrong in both directions. Um, the Fed is supposed to act like a governor on an on a engine, providing just the right amount of throttle that the engine needs to handle the load. And if they would just outsource the task of setting interest rate policy to the two-year note yield, they would do a much better job. Tom McClellan, editor of the McClellan Market Report. It is so great to welcome you to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me today, Tom. Nice to meet you. Well, it's nice to meet you too. And I'm excited to have you on. And I have to say it was a viewer recommendation that I um, bring you on. And I, I love my audience and they always have the best recommendations when it comes to guests. So I'm really excited to have you today. And Tom, I'd like to start where I always start with my guest. And that is just to get their big picture, macro view, the framework in which they're looking at the world today. So we can we start there with the big picture? And one of the things, Tom, is you can take all the time you need to set the table, if you will. Okay, fair enough. Um, just to start off, I'm a market timer. People say you can't time the market, but I take the opposite view that everyone times the market. Um, when you make an investment, you control the timing of it. And so trying to do that better is a, a, a worthwhile task to go after. It's tough. It's difficult to do. If it was easy, everybody could do it. Um, but it can be done with work. Um, and uh, if you don't mind, I, I brought some charts to share. So I propose to jump right into that if you don't mind. Let's go for it. The, the key point that my key philosophy when it comes to the stock market, or the, the overall stock market, is that there are only two fundamentals that matter. You can set aside dividend yield and earnings and EBITDA and book value. The only two fundamentals that matter are how much money is there and how much does that money want to be invested. And if you change either of those two things, you will move the market. Now, those things change on their own with cycles of liquidity and cycles of mood, and they get changed by news events and they get changed by Fed action. So they're changing all the time. That's why the market's moving all the time. But those are the only two things that matter. And so when you realize that those are the only two things that matter, it helps you set aside all the things that don't really matter so you can focus on what does. One of the big questions uh, that people are having in 2024 is where is this big recession that we were promised? And um, part of the promise of the recession was that we had an inverted yield curve and we still have it, which tends to always bring a recession, except why hasn't it brought one this time? And my answer is it's coming. People who think that it's supposed to be here already don't understand the 15 month lag at which the inverted yield curve works on GDP. In this chart, I'm comparing the spread between the 10 year treasury bond yield and the three month treasury yield. So it's it's one uh, aspect of the yield curve. You can't depict the entire yield curve in just one plot. So you pick two points on it, the 10 year and the three month. And, and the fact that we have a negative spread right now means that the yield curve is inverted. What I've done with this plot is I've shifted it forward by 15 months to reveal that its movements take that amount of time to show up in the change in GDP. This is real GDP and the quarterly change. And so you can see when we have negative excursions, that's when you have a recession. And those tend to echo inverted yield curve excursions by about 15 months lag. And you can see some prior examples. This chart goes back all the way to 1975. So here we are in the beginning of 2024, and we are just now arriving at the echo point of when yields first uh, inverted, which was in November of 2022. So if you count 15 months forward from November 2022, you get February of 2023, uh, 2024, excuse me, which is right where we're at right now in the first quarter. And I'm expecting that this inversion of the yield curve is going to matter for the, an economic growth generally. And it's also going to matter for corporate profits. This is a depiction of pre-tax corporate profits. And this is not S&P 500 profits. This is all companies as measured by the Bureau of Economic Analysis. And unfortunately, the data are only current through third quarter of last year because they take forever to calculate these data. So we haven't yet gotten the fourth quarter. But generally speaking, this same 10 year to three month spread offset 15 months forward tells you what corporate profits are going to look like. And so we're just now getting to the echo point of where this yield curve inversion started. And we can expect that for at least the next 15 months, we're going to see 
corporate profits being down. And why 15 months? I don't have a good answer. That's just what works in the data. Uh, we know that there are supposedly long and variable lags in the economy's response to, to inputs. It turns out that for a yield curve, it's not that variable. It's pretty much consistently 15 months. So we do have that coming. I don't think it's being reflected yet in anybody's expectations, certainly not in the Federal Reserve's expectations. They think that they've got time to wait for cutting rates. And uh, uh, I think that they're going to find out what the bond market has long known and what the yield curve uh, rules are. Um, that people think people with expensive PhDs think, oh, it's different this time. It's not different this time. One of the big picture forecasting tools that I discovered several years ago is I look at crude oil prices as a leading indication for the overall stock market. So this is crude oil prices back to 1890 uh, on plotted on a logarithmic scale and compared to the Dow Jones Industrial Average also plotted on a logarithmic scale. And the key insight here is I've shifted forward the price plot of crude oil by 10 years. And that allows us to see how the movements and the dance steps match up. And it doesn't always work perfectly, but generally speaking, when you get a rise in crude oil prices, 10 years later, you get a rise in the stock market. When crude oil prices go flat, the stock market goes flat. And you can even see it zoomed in on a very shorter, much shorter term basis. This is the same comparison. I'm just zooming in. And here we are in 2024, about to reach the 10-year echo of when crude oil prices peaked and, and just crashed back in the 2010s, uh, in the middle of the fracking boom. We are not yet quite at that 10-year echo point, which would equate to June of 2024, 10 years after crude oil's peak, but that's coming. Now, a couple points about this. The magnitude of the moves does not always match up. For example, we saw a huge move in crude oil prices back in 2008 to 2009, huge move. We did echo that movement, but much more, uh, much smaller. It arrived on time, just not with the same magnitude. Also worth noting is that there are exogenous events sometimes, like the Iraq War in 1990 to 91, which caused a doubling of crude oil prices, and then they gave it all back. We didn't get an echo of that exogenous event because that wasn't really a supply demand thing. That was a, a market's panicking thing. But generally speaking, the, the market has followed the footsteps of crude oil prices 10 years later. That means the next few years are not going to be so great, especially between now and early 2026, as the stock market echoes this big decline that we saw in crude oil prices. The good news is if you're a bull, early 2026 will be a great time to be an investor and ride it all the way to 2028. But we have to get through some ugly times before we get there. Now, with the expectation of a top ideally in June, and I see ideally because it's not exactly perfectly 10 years all the time, uh, we're, we go looking for confirming signs of trouble, and we're not seeing that yet. Right now, the, uh, the stock market's been making higher highs. The New York Stock Exchange advanced decline line has also been making higher highs, so there's no divergence showing yet. This is an important indication of liquidity to look at the NYSE advanced decline line, it's calculated by looking at how many stocks go up every day versus how many stocks go down every day. And you look at the difference of that between those two, that's known as the daily breadth. If you calculate it on a cumulative basis, you get the advanced decline line. So if more stocks are going up every day, the advanced decline line goes higher. If more stocks are going down every day, then the advanced decline line trends lower. Most of the time, the advanced decline line does whatever prices are going to do. But when you see a divergence, when you see a disagreement, that's when it gets interesting. Back in 2022, we saw a big divergence that said uh, um, the, the bear market is not over. We still have some ugliness to do. But then gradually, the advanced decline line started acting stronger. We saw a little bit of a divergence at the beginning of 2024, where the advanced decline line was making lower highs and lower lows, co contrary to what prices were doing. But that got rehabilitated in February. And uh, we've seen strength since then. That says liquidity is plentiful. When you have strong liquidity, you don't get the biggest types of problems. You can still have ordinary garden variety corrections, but you don't get big problems. And the big problems I'm talking about, here's an example. This is the advanced decline line from a long time ago. This is one of my uh, old collection of charts. 
back in to, when the stock market peaked at the and the in the and the uh, internet bubble in 2000, we'd already had lots of deterioration in the advanced decline line for almost two years going on before the final the stock market finally peaked. It said liquidity was in uh, big trouble. We saw the same sort of message in 2007. Stocks peaked in October 2007, but the advanced decline line peaked four months earlier in June 2007 and was moving down saying liquidity was in trouble. The point is we're not seeing that right now. We're not yet seeing signs of liquidity problems. That's what I'm going to be looking for as 2024 rolls on, but we're not seeing it yet. Now, um, I got into this business back in 1995. I was an Army helicopter pilot. Uh, having great time serving around the world and, and doing great things. Uh, got out of the Army in, in 1993 and decided to join my father and my mother in the business. My parents created something known as the McClellan Oscillator back in 1969, named for Sherman and Marion McClellan. My dad is still alive. He's going to turn 90 this year. We're still working together. He's still doing great. My mom passed away in 2003 from cancer, but I still have the great privilege of working with my father. The McClellan Oscillator is based on the advanced decline statistics, and it looks at the difference between two moving averages of the daily advanced decline data. And generally speaking, when the McClellan Oscillator is positive, stock market's going up. When the McClellan Oscillator is negative, stock market's going down. It can get to extremes, but it also does something cool where it shows us the structure. If you have a complex structure of McClellan Oscillator readings on one side of zero, that says that that is the side that's in charge. You can also get a complex structure below zero, um, says the bears are in charge. What we're seeing just recently is nobody's in charge. We're seeing simple structures on both sides of zero, meaning neither the bulls nor the bears are in charge. Uh, the up uptrend is still going on despite the bulls supposedly not being in charge. But the message is that there's no real great impetus to bring us a new surge. The, the market is just continuing higher on seasonality and 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 coasting. But it, if it runs into liquidity problems, which I'm expecting a little bit later this spring, uh, we could have some big trouble. We're similarly not seeing a problem in high yield bonds. Um, this is an advanced decline line uh, calculated on corporate high yield bonds, which tend to move just like stock prices do. Uh, except that these are super sensitive to liquidity. And so we saw back in 2021, huge divergence developing versus stock prices with, with the a corporate high yield bond saying there is big liquidity problems. And they were right. In 2022, saw a big, ugly bear market. Uh, but generally speaking, they've been doing better since then, doing better, especially now that this a corporate bond, uh, high yield bond advanced decline line is making higher highs along with prices. So no sign of liquidity problems yet. Uh, we're reaching a point in the calendar year, though, when we could be running into problems. One of the earliest pieces of analysis I did uh, starting back in 1994 was I synthesized something called the presidential cycle pattern by averaging the, together the stock market's performance in four year chunks of time. Um, and generally speaking, the first two years of a new presidential term are flat. The third year is always an up year. The fourth year, the election year, is generally an up year. But there are differences, I've found, between if you have a first-term president from a new party versus the last one, versus if you have a second-term president running for uh, who is not uh, who's term limited and prevented from running for re-election. The green pattern represents the condition we're in now, where President Biden is still in his first term and running for re-election. Generally speaking, the election year, when you have that condition, is an up year. The green line goes up because first-term presidents generally win in re-election, and generally the election year is an up year. If you have a second-term president, the red line, then election year is generally much flatter and especially down into the election. The question is, are we going to still have President Biden running for re-election as the summer rolls on? And that's a legitimate question since his poll numbers are not doing so well <clears throat> and he's not doing so well mentally and physically. And so the question is, is the Democratic Party going to replace him and then switch us off of that, that incumbent pattern, the green pattern, and switch us to something more like the second term president pattern. Um, what is interesting right now is that there's no conflict between the patterns between now and about mid-May, where both patterns show a sideways 
um, behavior for the stock market. And then we get into uh, into late May and, and early June and July when the stock, the both patterns start up again, but then there's a big difference heading into the election. So I'll be watching that in my newsletter and seeing which pattern the stock market decides to follow this time. But for the next about two months, there's no conflict in what they're seeing. Now, part of why I think the stock market could transition for, out of this linear up wave and into a more sideways is that taxes are going to be a problem. Taxes have a big relationship to what the stock market does. If tax collections are very low, meaning the, the Treasury Department is not taking a bunch of your money in the form of taxes and leaving that money in the banking system so that it can lift stock prices, that tends to be a very favorable condition for stock market behavior. If you get taxes up very high, meaning that the Treasury Department is taking a very large bite of the economy in the form of taxes, that tends to be a very unfavorable condition for the stock market. In fact, every time since 1930s, every time that you get taxes at, at up to above 18% of GDP, every time you get a recession, including back in 2022, when we did have two quarters of negative GDP growth, because taxes got up too high, we were eating too much of the seed corn, we were consuming too much of the banking system money, and leaving not enough of it to help lift stock prices. Um, thankfully for the stock market bulls, that's come crashing back down, uh, because we had low capital gains tax, uh, low capital gains being accumulated in 2022. So people in 2023 paid low capital gains taxes, and we've got a very low tax bite right now, which has helped push up the stock market as as we're seeing right now. But that's likely to change. In fact, here here is a, a more um, exact depiction. This is federal tax receipts, um, the trailing 12 month toll, and I'm comparing it to the S and P 500 which is shifted forward by 12 months. And it just goes to show that tax collection will do whatever the stock market was doing 12 months before. And so we've had a, a drop in tax collections, which is horrible for the debt and the deficit, but that just reflects what was happening in 2022. We have not yet reflected the rebound in 2023 and into 2024, which the tax collections are gonna start to reflect here shortly. Pardon me, I'm getting over a cold and so I'm popping cough drops trying to keep the voice box lubricated. Generally speaking, if you run a deficit like we're running now, that is very bullish for stocks. If you get to where you're running a surplus like we had right after World War II, that's very bearish for stocks. They ran a surplus in 1929 and 1930, seeing economic troubles coming and they wanted to save up some money. That was very bearish to have a surplus then. We had a, a bearish, the last time we had an actual surplus was 1957. We haven't had a surplus since then. We got close in 2000, but and even just getting close was bearish for the stock market. Thankfully for the bulls, we've been running huge federal deficits, which is terribly bullish. But if we ever change that, and if we ever try to pay off our debt, um, as we should, that's gonna create a problem because a, a surplus or even getting close is a lot more bearish for the stock market. And we can see that just looking at the federal deficit on a 12 month rolling basis. If you see a nice big spike up in the federal deficit, that's very bullish for stock prices. Nice big spike up, very bullish for stock prices. When you see them start to diverge, as the deficit is coming back down, stock prices are rising, that's a problem. We saw that in the mid 2000s. We saw big deficits early in, in, in the 2000s, and then it was coming down into 2007. That was a problem for the stock market meaning liquidity was drying up and it had to be met by big surge in deficits, which was hugely bullish for the stock market. Here's the COVID response, which saw a huge deficit, of course, as everybody remembers. We're still running very high deficits, but not quite as high as we were in 2023. So we're already seeing the makings of a divergence here where stock prices are going higher, the deficit is coming down. And if this comes down a lot, it's gonna create a big a liquidity problem for the stock market. I think that's gonna happen for some important reasons. 2023 was a big up year for the stock market. And so as you and I are all getting our 1040s uh, prepared and about to mail them off, uh, not later than April 15th, a lot of us have capital gains that we've accumulated from those 2023 stock market gains. 
That means that capital gains tax collections are going to be higher during 2024 than they were last year, because in 2023, your capital gains taxes were calculated based on what happened in 2022. So when you have a big up here like 2023 was, capital gains taxes that we all have to pay on April 15th are going to be higher. But that affects us for the whole year because all the quarterly estimated payments for that we paid during 2024 are calculated based on our tax liability during 2023. In fact, you have to make sure that you withhold at least 110% of your 2023 tax liability. So because 2023 was an up year for stocks and up year for capital gains, a lot more people are going to be paying a whole lot of money on April 15th. And again, in June, September, and January, as we make those quarterly estimated payments. That's going to be the big stumbling block that's going to create an illiquidity problem for the stock market, a problem which is not showing up yet in the data, but which I think is going to show up. Now, um, one more chart I'll share is talking about the Federal Reserve, which right now they're still at five and a quarter to five and a half percent is the target rate for the Fed funds target. That's the black line up here. What the Fed doesn't seem to understand is that the two year Treasury note yield knows better than all the 400 PhDs at the Fed what the Fed is going to do with interest rates, and it knows it ahead of time. So when you see the two-year note yield going up, the Fed eventually follows suit and gets to the program. But then the Fed sticks around at high rates too long and creates a problem by being overly tight just as the economy is shifting. We saw that back in 2000. We saw that back in 2007. The Fed, Fed stayed too high for too long and then had to have rates crashing back down once they realized the mistake. We are seeing that same thing now. There's about a three quarters of a point spread between what the two-year note says and what the PhDs at the Fed say. This is creating a lot of damage This by having the spread stay wide like this for a long time like this. The longer that this stays in effect, the worse the problem is going to be once the Fed finally wakes up and realizes it. If I was in charge of Fed policy, I would say, OK, immediate overnight three quarters of a point cut right now, and then we'll follow and watch the, the two years says. But thankfully, I'm not in charge of Fed policy. I have a much better life than if I was hanging around with those guys. Wow. Tom, I have to say, what a treat to get to go through those charts. And I know the audience is going to love it. A few follow-on questions. Let's let's stay on the Fed topic right now. So in your mind, based on what that chart is showing and what the two-year Treasury note is indicating, they're staying too tight for too long. And if you were in charge, you'd want an immediate uh, three-quarters um, cut right now. So my question for you is, um, what's going to happen when they stay too tight for too long? And um, why do you think they are staying that tight? Is this like inflation battle? Do you think this is, it's kind of pointless at this point? I would love to explore that further. The, the first point to understand is the Fed's effect on inflation is very limited. They think that they have a big effect on inflation, but they're wrong. The, the data just do not support that. But yet they, they all have expensive PhDs in economics. And so they think that they know better than the bond market. Um, and so keeping the, the rates high right now, it does retard the economy. It doesn't really have an effect on inflation, which gets affected by other factors. It's a, it's a mistaken belief that a robust economy, which produces lots of goods and services, means higher prices. If you have a robust economy producing lots of good and goods and lots of services, then you have lots of supply of those things, and that tends to make prices come down. The Fed officials don't understand this, but this is how they were taught by the economics professors who were taught that by other economic professors going back generations. And so, um, thankfully, I, I am not encumbered by any formal training in economics, and so I don't have as much to unlearn as the Fed officials do. They think that they are infecting, affecting inflation, and by keeping rates high, they think that they are helping when really all that they're doing is they're retarding economic activity, retarding the ability of the economy to produce lots of goods and services to help bring prices back down because they're making capital very expensive. When you raise interest rates like this, you raise the price of capital and thus, thus you raise the cost of everything that you would do with that capital. But the Fed is doing more to contribute to inflation with their high rates than they are to retard it. Um, we have seen 
through lots of episodes that when they stay too high for too long, uh, just as, as recently as 2019, they finally realized it. Uh, when they stay too high for too long, they retard economic growth and they create problems. Similarly, when they stay too low for too long, as they did in the middle of the last decade, they fuel too much economic growth. They fuel bubbles and fuel excesses and over uh, building and over speculation. So the Fed gets it wrong in both directions. Um, the Fed is supposed to act like a governor on a on an engine providing just the right amount of throttle that the engine needs to handle the load. And if they would just outsource the task of setting interest rate policy to the two-year note yield, they would do a much better job. All right. And also going back to your charts, um, you mentioned that a recession is coming. We haven't seen signs of a liquidity problem yet, but you're paying close attention to the presidential cycle, the election, of course, taxes. Um, in terms of the recession call, do you have a timeline? Do you see this more in like the back half of the year? I don't know if you shared a timeline for it, but if you have one, could you share it? Here is uh, that chart again I showed of corporate profits. And this again, this is all corporations, not just publicly traded ones. And this is only current through the third quarter of 2023. It will echo the movements of the 10-year versus three-month yield spread, or basically it echoes the movements of the yield curve. We have seen an inversion of that where it's gone below zero and it's still moving down and staying down. So that means that for at least the next 15 months, we should expect corporate profit profits to be going down and staying down. Only when we see the Fed start to let up and allow short-term rates to come back down to where long-term rates are and we get a disinversion of the yield curve, only then plus 15 months only then is when we start to see a recovery in the economic data. So we we still have the Fed with its foot jammed on the brakes, still inverting the yield curve. And so you have to wait for the 15 month lag time to go by. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the yield curve. We had um, Professor Campbell Harvey on, on Professor Harvey Campbell um, on and he was the creator of the inverted yield curve indicator. We had him on earlier this year. It was a fascinating discussion and bringing up the 10 year with the three month, because I know some people do the 10 and the two, but he points to the 10 and the three month. And so I'm glad you brought up that one. Um, also, it's not bad. If you did the 10 year versus the one year or the 10 year versus the six month, it's not significantly different. They're basically telling the same story. Yeah. Okay. So going back um, to like the, the two fundamental things that really matters, how much money and how much does it want to be invested? And I really liked when you brought up the McClellan oscillator and um, telling a bit more of the story there. But what was interesting was you pointed to like, we're in a simple complex that neither the bulls nor the bears are in charge. Could you explain that a little bit further and the implications for markets when I guess neither is in charge, what that means? Well, over the long term, the stock market trends higher. Uh, roughly 8% annualized over the last 100 years or so. <clears throat> and so if you have a 100-year time horizon, you should stay fully invested and expect to get your 8%. But we all know, that if we've paid attention for more than a day, that it goes through periods where it's trending higher, it goes through periods where it's chopping sideways, and it goes through, unfortunately, periods where it's trending lower <clears throat> as part of that overall long trend. And so when you have an upward impulsive phase, the bulls are in charge. When you have a downward impulsive phase like 2008, the bears are in charge. And, and that's one of the tricks that the McClellan oscillator does is it tells you who's in charge. Right now, the, the statement from the McClellan oscillator is that neither side is in charge. The big cap indices like the S&P 500 have been able to still cruise a little bit higher, not significantly higher, but a little bit higher for the last month and a half um as nobody's gotten any a sense of alarm or any sign of trouble i think that that sense of alarm is going to come when banks start running out of money as people are writing out their checks in april to mail to the irs and that creates a drain on the liquidity available to the stock market and that starts showing up i think that in stock price movements i think that that moment is coming but today is still March 26th, and so nobody's writing there. If you got a big check to write to the IRS, you're going to wait till about April 13th to mail that. You're not going to mail that now. You could earn in a couple of weeks worth of money market interest at 5% on it by sitting on that money for a little bit longer. So there's going to be a wait, a big delay as everybody waits till the last minute to write their check. And then the IRS is going to cash all those checks all at once. 
creating a ripple through the banking system that's going to create a little bit of more excitement for the stock market. Interesting. Okay, that's something to definitely watch in the coming weeks. Um, also, this notion that we haven't reached the top yet. Let me ask you this about the markets, because it seems like, well, not seems, a handful of names have been really driving the performance. Um, what do you make of that? That, you know, there's just been a handful of stocks that have been really driving the returns. <clears throat> How does that play out or in, impact? Um, well, it does seem that way in terms of looking at NVIDIA, for example, mm -hmm. or um, some of the other high-flying tech names that they're getting all the news. But in reality, the New York Stock Exchange advanced decline line is still making the higher highs. And we're seeing um, lots of new highs uh, versus new lows last week. Um, and so generally speaking, it is a broad advance. It's just not getting covered that way in the financial media. At the point where this changes, and then advanced decline line is not going higher in conjunction with stocks. Then we have the message that, uh oh, liquidity is a problem. Part of this is that <clears throat> that I, I liken this to a, a a pig farm where you've got a mother sow and she's got a litter of eleven little piggies. Mm -hmm. If the mother is a great milk producer, then all eleven of her little piggies are going to do great, and they're going to all going to get plenty of milk, and they can all do well, just like the stock market can all be in an uptrend. If the mother piggy is a bad milk producer, then the biggest of the, her piglets will muscle their way in to get their share of, of the milk, but the runts are gonna get muscled aside and they won't be able to get fed as well. So if you wanna know how good of a milk producer the mother pig is, don't look at the, the biggest of her little piglets, look at what the runts are doing. That's the beauty of the advanced decline line. Every stock on the NYSE gets an equal vote in this. And so if you have a bunch of runs that all start to suffer, it doesn't matter what the big cap stocks are doing, what Apple and NVIDIA are, and, and Amazon are doing, it matters what the runs are doing. And this was what we'll tell you. We're not getting that message yet. I'm expecting that message to develop over the next three months or so. And then for the last half of 2024 to be a rather unpleasant time for the stock market. But we're not at that inflection point yet. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, because you, you're you um, a technical analyst. You are a trader, um, not necessarily an, like, an, you, I take it you have a shorter time frame. So how do you, how are you kind of thinking about this environment, playing this environment? What can you share about maybe what you're doing to navigate this environment? Well, I will trade on, on any time frame that I can figure that I can get an edge uh, using the tools I have to make sense out of it. So I trade long-term sometimes, I trade short-term sometimes. Um, the, the key that you have to know is, are you trading with the trend or against it? And you can make money both of those ways, but not all the time. If you're trading with the trend, you're going to make the most money in the long run over the longest period of time, and you're going to have the most chance of success. But you can have some great counter trend down moves, even in an uptrend. So you have to know which game you're playing and you have to know, therefore, what shoes to put on to play that game. You don't want to put basketball shoes to go play soccer on a muddy field. It just doesn't work that way. Um, so understand the game that you're playing, understanding what can go wrong if you get the game wrong and the market goes against you and how you're going to get out of that position. Um, those are the general guidelines. This year, we are in an election year which has much more uh, doubt and uncertainty than the third year of a presidential term, like 2023, which is nearly always an up year. The last time that the third year was not an up year was 1939, and that was when the Wehrmacht was rolling through Poland and threatening the, 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 the Eastern Front. And uh, generally speaking, that was a bad condition for the stock market. Outside of conditions like 1939, the third year is a, is a generally an up year, and 2023 was. Now we're in a year where there's a lot more doubt, there's a lot more uncertainty, and people, remember that, how much money is there and how much does that money want to be invested? The Fed is still um, bringing in a lot of money uh, as reverse repos roll off. That's providing a lot of money to the banking system. That's uh, providing money to the stock market. But people who are in charge of that money People are starting to feel a little bit more twitchy, especially as the, the political calendar heats up and everybody starts contemplating what's going to happen in November and what's that going to mean for next year? And what's that going to mean for my portfolio? People feeling twitchy like they do in an election year starts to matter and uh, it can start to create its own um, 
side effects on what the stock market does when people are starting to feel twitchy, just like when people are feeling twitchy in a, in a game of musical chairs and you see everybody running for a chair, even though you think you still hear the music, you, you if everybody else is running for a chair, you join the crowd. At the same time, we're going to have taxes in the Treasury Department start to pull out the fact factor number one, how much money is there, and the, the government's going to start taking more of its share of it. And that's going to leave less of it in the banking system to help fuel the stock market. So we're going to get a confluence of both of those factors during 2024. Yeah. Let me ask you a couple more questions before I let you go. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Um, One of the topics that often comes up on this program too is (laughs) gold. And I, I don't think we've even brought up gold. Do you have a take on gold and just more, I guess I'll leave it more broad and open ended, Um, but gold, it is a popular topic on the channel. Gold uh, is important in my, in my work. I've been a, a back when Timer Didos was publishing. Uh, I was the Gold Timer of the Year for several years uh, running. Um, it is important, and gold is important because of what it says about other things. So, for example, grain prices will echo gold prices with about a twelve month lag time, and that means that the big gains that we've seen in gold over the last twelve months, those are coming for grain prices which means that it's coming for food inflation and thus for inflation overall. That's why it's important to watch gold. Right now, there's been a big surge into gold. Um, We've seen a huge surge in total open interest in gold futures, which says that this is a short-term top and that, that it's been overdone. At the same time, the commercial traders in the Commitment of Traders report, commercial traders of gold have moved up to a big net short position in gold futures and also in silver futures. And they tend to be the smart money. When they get net short in a huge way, they're saying this is a good price to be a seller. And so I'm expecting gold to pull back, but I am expecting more gains, especially once we get past a, an important cycle low, there's a 13 and a half month cycle in gold prices. That's due to bottom later this year. So I'm expecting that during 2025 will be a much better time to be a gold investor than it is for the rest of this year. Mm-hmm. And another topic that's been coming up to um, Bitcoin, I don't know if that's an area you follow or if there, if you have a take there, if it signals anything maybe around liquidity, but do you have a point of view as it relates to Bitcoin? The funny thing about Bitcoin is that starting in 2022, it jumped into a tight correlation with gold prices, a, a, a relationship that had not existed before 2022. They had been just uh, totally independent, but something happened in April of 2022, and they jolted into a, a very tight correlation. And if you look at that correlation very closely, you find that gold prices tend to lead Bitcoin price movements by about a week. So whatever gold we're doing was doing about a week ago, that's what Bitcoin prices are going to be doing. It's not always perfect, and the magnitudes are all over the place. But this is more about the timing of the dance steps and the direction of the movements. Bitcoin prices move way more in percentage terms than gold do. And so this is not about the percentage moves, but this is about the direction of movements. Um, Gold prices have stalled a little bit and should be heading down. Uh, They were up earlier today on the 26th of March, and they're heading down now. So I'm expecting that gold prices are going to start coming back down. That's going to help bring Bitcoins back down. Uh, but only that, that forecast is only valid for about a week because that's a, as much of a leading indication as gold gives us for Bitcoin prices. Yeah, it's interesting just hearing the different relationships. And finally, I really enjoyed when you mentioned you mentioned that you work with your father, um, Sherman McClellan, and the famed McClellan Oscillator, which is one of these closely followed um, indicators. Can you, one, I want to hear more about the story there, about the work that your parents did, and also just more about you. It sounds like are you, you're you like the steward of the, the McClellan Oscillator these days. Can you just share more of that story, the origin story, why this matters? I just would love to hear more there. Sure. Um, my dad <clears throat> went to Claremont Men's College, which is now Claremont McKenna College, for the reasons you might imagine. And he met my mother who went to the neighboring Pomona College back in the 1950s. My dad was a business and finance major. My mother was a mathematics major uh, back in the 50s at a time when it was not very fashionable for young ladies to pursue that, but she was a math whiz, um, daughter of a a PhD astronomer, my grandfather. um, And so she pursued math because she was interested in it. And it really took their combined talents of his finance and, and 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 economics training and her math training to be able to do things in terms of figuring out what the, the, the data meant. They knew that 
uh, studying the market in the 1960s, they knew that breadth data, advanced decline data were important, but they weren't quite sure exactly how. And what they were doing when my dad really wanted to get going on, on studying this, he was just in his 30s then. Um, back in the 1960s, you had 3% stock commissions. So nobody was an active trader unless you were on the floor. No, no amateur no investor sitting at home was an active trader. We, we didn't have ETFs. We didn't have futures, didn't have options. So you just bought and sold stocks and you paid a huge commission when you did that. So you weren't looking to buy and sell and buy and sell and buy and sell. What you were looking for is to buy and hold. But what my dad noticed was that about two or three times a year, there was a nice low at which if you had bought in at that low, uh, for the prices, you would get a higher yield on your dividends that you would be collecting on those stocks that you were buying. So he wanted to try to figure out a way to figure out when are those lows going to be or how do you know that you're at one? And so that's why he and my mom started looking at the breadth statistics. They were followers of a guy named Pete Harlan, who published the Trade Levels Report. Pete Harlan was an actual rocket scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California who in his spare time dabbled in the stock market and, and liked following it. Uh, Pete Harlan was the first guy west of the Mississippi to ever use a computer um, for stock market analysis because he had access to one. So he would do his day job of tracking satellites and, and calculating rocket trajectories during the day for JPL. And then at night, he would go home and punch holes in IBM cards to reflect price data that happened. And then he'd feed that in the computer and, and run analysis on it. Pete Harlan was the first guy that introduced the, the math of calculating an exponential moving average to stock price data because he knew about the math of that uh, from rocketry. Um, in a simple moving average, like a 50-day simple moving average, you got to keep track of every price for the last 50 days and average them all together. Well, if you're doing that manually, calculating things in a ledger, it's computationally intensive. Doesn't have any trouble for my spreadsheet program to do it now, but back in the in in the 60s. It was very computationally intensive to calculate a simple moving average. An exponential moving average, you only have to keep track of what is yesterday's EMA value and what is today's new price. That's the only things you have to know. So it's computationally a lot simpler. Well, my parents were following Pete Harlan, <clears throat> and Pete Harlan advocated using exponential moving averages for tracking data, including breadth data. The key insight that my parents had was they looked at the difference between two exponential moving averages, something that Harlan wasn't doing. He would look at each of them on his own. So in 1969, they created what later came to be known as the McClellan oscillator, looking at the difference between two exponential moving averages of daily breadth data. Many years later, another fellow named Gerald Appel borrowed that same idea of looking at two different moving averages uh, and the difference between them. And he created what came to be known as MACD or the moving average convergence divergence indicator. But it was my parents who were, were the first ones in 1969 that had this idea of looking at two different moving averages. I was no help at that time because I was playing with skateboards and Hot Wheels and uh, I was not calculating exponential moving averages when I was eight years old. Uh, it was only later <clears throat> that um, the work of my parents got a lot more interesting once I became an adult. Uh, my teenage years, I already knew everything, so I didn't need to ask them about anything. But later, they got more interesting. And so as I was winding down my Army career, I started getting interested in the stock market and, and in what my parents did and, and decided that that would be a good avenue for me to pursue. And it's been great. We've been publishing a newsletter since 1995. Uh, when we started, it was all printed and mailed because the internet was not really a thing yet. And so um, my kids are, who are grown now, they got very good at putting labels and stamps on envelopes to get the, the big mailing out every two weeks when we sent out our newsletter. Uh, we finally figured out in 1997 how to create a PDF file. And uh, we converted to the newsletter to electronic format over time. It took a long time to because we had a lot of older subscribers who didn't understand this computer stuff and had to walk people through how do you how do you get email and how do you have a PDF file open on your computer. Uh, and now it's all um, electronically distributed and and it's a pretty good gig. I love that. And I love the family story as well. Tom, really enjoyed having you on. I want to give you the final few minutes here to let folks know um, you know, how they can support your work, uh, subscribe to your work, and any parting thoughts, maybe something that we didn't bring up in the conversation or even something that you might want to re-emphasize. The floor is yours. 
Well, the best way to learn more about the work that we do, come to our website. It's mcoscillator.com. That's just a contraction of McClellan Oscillator. It's like a McNugget, except it's a Mc Oscillator. Uh, when you go there, you can see uh, our big free learning center. We have uh, lots of different articles about the indicators we follow in our learning center. I publish a free chart and focus email every week. It's just a way to get people more acquainted with the indicators I use and the analytical techniques. If you want the good stuff, we have a twice monthly newsletter and a daily edition. You can find sample issues on our website to learn about subscribing there, but there's plenty of free information to look at. We post a chart every day of the McClellan oscillator right on our website. So if you want to know what the oscillator is doing, is it positive or negative? Has it gone to an extreme value? Is it, is it diverging? You can see that right on our website. Uh, give it a try and take a look. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Tom McClellan, editor of the McClellan Market Report. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time, your ideas, all of your knowledge, and those amazing charts. Really appreciate you taking the time, Tom. Nice to meet you, Julia.